Thank you, Mick, very much for a very provocative talk, as always. We get, with Mick, we always get nuggets that we need to chew on for quite a while and then do things with them. The rule of truth and the truth of rule, when truth strikes, life in probation, saying yes or no to rule, the self-corruption of truth, the truth is inaccessible to knowledge, opacity is a subject of reason, and I can go on and on and on. So thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of debate to be had and questions from the audience. So we have some time to raise questions to him and I'm gonna be chairing the question and answer session. Could you please speak out quite loud? Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was wondering if you could say something about uh, courage as a property of individuals. Do you reckon that this only individual who display this sense of courage, or where can be groups of people? I think that's one of the aspects of this whole reflection that troubles me most. Um, I guess at the minute I've come to the conclusion it's difficult. It's difficult to describe courage, it seems to me, given this analysis. It's difficult to describe courage as a property that a subject or an individual has before the context within which he or she is forced to display it. It doesn't seem to, well, at least in this particular case of these three, that provoked the lecture as much as anything else. I was already reading for cold lectures, but the essence of these three, you just cannot ignore it. And I don't think that they had courage prior to the positions in which they found themselves and being detonated, who knows by what incidental provocation. That might have set them off. Snowden and Manning in particular, I'm thinking of. Assange is a different case. Uh, one might say that he developed courage over a long period, perhaps. Um, I haven't studied or invested a great deal of time in documenting and engaging in the debates specifically about Assange. Fascinating kind of film biography made of him uh, recently. But he clearly was involved in the refusal of informational rule and truth from a very early age. He was clearly a marginal uh, figure uh, in, in social terms uh, via his upbringing and via his early history in hacking um, and eventually uh, bringing that um, business of hacking because according to his own account wasn't courage that was involved in the hacking. He was just curious. I mean, he, was, he was just a creature who was fascinated by these technologies. And when he hacked systems, it wasn't because he had any wider political, social, or political purpose in mind. It just, like a car mechanic taking an engine to pieces, or a clock mechanic taking a, a watch to pieces, you can't figure out how they work. And it was a thrill. And a lot of hackers described this. I like that. So I don't even think originally courage could be said to be the property of the subject during the time. But to some degree, I think he may have developed it over the course of his career, <coughs> particularly in finding, in finding WikiLeaks and then in, in, in taking that step, which was a huge step to take, which is to open on the web a site where anybody who wants to leak information could leak it securely. This is now a crisis in the whole evaluation of the science, securely because he wasn't going to reveal who it was who the information. Um, it's, so I, th I think probably my provisional answer is it's a property that a subject acquires, probably unwillingly, certainly unwittingly, as a consequence of certain circumstances of extreme threat and difficulty in which they find themselves. In that courage is much more a matter of enduring those circumstances and suffering those circumstances and prevailing in and through those circumstances than it is the idea of the soldier coming out of the trench, a 
attacking a machine gun site or dragging an injured colleague out of no man's land. Courage too. But I would, in my experience of reading about war and battle and combat especially, the same seems to apply. The individual doesn't have the property before the event that incites it. Does it exist outside the, the, the situation? Courage? Is that something that can be upholds after? Yeah. 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 In, in, many, in many asides in Foucault's work, he always refers to the outside. He tends to do it mostly because he's very coy about it. Uh, just by so sort of giving much of what he wants to say. Uh, he, he often refers to it when he's talking about literature and he's, he's reading, doing a reading of certain novelists or authors or something. And he's more explicit about referring to an outside. When pushed even informally in his work, he would admit to there being something outside, <coughs> and outside to our practices, to our knowing, to the history of human history. And recognizes how that outside impacts on, impinges on. And he's always already at work within us, kind of dead a day in inflection. One wonders whether dead a day already from Foucault, or whether, you know, whether Foucault was kind of responding to and learning from his students. But, but in any event, this outside is strictly not outside, because it's always already operant inside. And it affects and changes the nature of what the inside is and its constitution and its makeup. I suppose outside is the term then that's indicating um, influences, forces, uh, probably much more. An openness to something that is not within one's control. But that nonetheless is operant within the self as the self makes its way through its shared existence. And courage might well be as, well, in a way, I suppose, I'm talking about truth in that sense. Not in a way. That is the way I'm talking about truth as well. That there are things that impact from outside, or or, or the outside has an impact. I mean, Derrida, in a certain works that insight, as you know, linguistically, in terms of language, the operation of language, it works in a very particular, systematically works in a particular way. Here I'm doing it much more loosely, because I think, because I think it operates much more loosely here in relation to courage and truth. Yeah. Can I get an idea as but, to... Oh, oh sorry. Maybe so just one, one final one. But, but clearly there's a propensity. The subject may not be structured such that it can know the truth through connaissance in a straightforward matter of knowledge production. Okay. But clearly, clearly here the implication must be, and I think I would share in it, that the self is structured in such a way that the propensity tell the truth, the propensity to be impacted by truth, the propensity to have courage, is there as part of the composition of the self, as is the propensity to lie, as is the propensity to run the other way, as is, hmm, those are the features and, 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 and factors, and that they are, they are, as it were, the portals that the self has to a world which it inhabits but in which it secures no tenure of possession, knowledge or understanding. This is the slave at the back of the mind saying, remember, you're more. Sorry. I, I want to get an idea as to how many people want to ask questions because we're running short of time. So I have one here, one there, three. Okay, good. So that's good. Uh, yeah, first, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dylan, for an uh, indeed very inspiring lecture, which I have to read three times before I get all uh, of it, but there's one element that I'd like, like to raise here, and that you, you make a linkage between two levels of abstraction, and you talk about Foucault in abstract sense, and then suddenly we have the whistleblowers as concrete examples of, of the people uh, uh, showing the courage of truth. Um, what are the criteria for, for qualifying there in this concrete sense? And would, for example, a character like Osama bin Laden qualify as well by taking an extraordinary moment in showing uh, the unreason of 
economic, military, and political power of the U.S. in this sense. So, so what are the criteria, and why would you exclude him if you don't want him on your list? Thank you. Good question. Um, I wouldn't want to exclude him at all. Uh, and I think, in fact, uh, the propensity of our rulers over the last 10 to 15 years, 20 years, but let's not forget, step outside the rule of truth when it suits them. Um, if one doesn't understand that somebody like Osama bin Laden inhabits his own rule of truth, truth book, if one doesn't understand that one's categorizing him as mad because of a certain act of differentiation, which is politically as well as epistemically charged by you, there is no possibility of dealing with the phenomenon of refusal that has been organized under, via, through Al Qaeda. What you will finish up with is exactly what we finished up with, is a categorization of them as terror, which is just the contemporary term for political madness and reason, for which there are certain standard responses, none of which, it seems to me, uh, are going to be or have been effective. One is extraordinary rendition, which is essentially a kind of um, great confinement. Lettre de cachet. Pick them up, throw them away somewhere, and keep them out of sight and out of use. Or annihilation, which is to take them on militarily. Um, and finally, a kind of um, war of rhetoric and consigns of two of these, which you then yourselves become taken over by. So you begin to believe your own categorizations and act according to them. And it just seems to me that that just commits you to an endless war. And that's one response. But if that endless war is one that you think somehow has to be ended. Then there are arts of politics and truth and rule which have to be discovered, which provide a solvent to the existing categorizations. Start to break them up and look for different formulations by which those who are terrorists become some way part of a newly defined realm of political reason. It sounds as if that is entirely impossible. It's not. It happens all the time. The history of British imperial retreat is a history of doing exactly that. Up to and including a kind of imperial retreat from Northern Ireland. And that is what a so-called peace process, at least there, finished up doing. So abandoning the, uh, uh, the distinctions between reason and non-reason, between political madness and uh, political legitimacy that are obtained in relation to the violence in Northern Ireland, in order to renegotiate and re-describe the entire discourse of that territory in ways that brought in precisely those who, on the British government side, were well known to have been murderers and killers. I think there is, for my own, for my own preferences and political instincts, there is an art in doing that. There's a necessity in doing that. And if you don't do that, then you're faced with prison or war. I don't think those alternatives are ones that we can afford given the kinds of uh, uh, globally dangerous international, local, global conflicts, particularly in the Middle East, that we now enjoy. So yeah, I don't think Obama was mad. I don't think Al Qaeda was mad. There is a reason. It's incumbent upon thinkers to think about that reason. I would say it's part of the task of the thinkers of international relations to think about that reasoning, rather than participate in the governmental practices that just seek additional ways of dealing with the matter. 
Okay, we're going to take the two questions uh, one after the other because we're running a short of time. So in the back, please. Uh, I wonder, you talked about the different propensities that should be part of everybody, maybe to uh, seek knowledge or uh, also to be uh, vulnerable to truth, maybe, when it strikes. Would you say there's a way in which you can um, make yourself more vulnerable to one or the other? Is there any responsibility involved? Or is it just because it's, it starts to sound completely random? So courage, it, it, you were forced to be courage when truth strikes, but you know, who knows? And then it just seems sort of a void category because then, you know, there's no, um, there's just no ethical connotation to it anymore, which I think might be problematic. Yeah, okay. And um, the second question here, like, please, okay. Tanya? Yeah. Um, actually, it makes it quite nicely, so you might be able to combine both. I was wondering if I could... Is this a face I recognize? Yes. Okay. Tanya, please speak up so they can hear in the back. Sorry. I was wondering if I could get you to comment more on the transformation of the subject that is struck by truth and I can quite like the image of being struck. Mm. Um, because I don't know whether you would agree with this, but it seems to me that that is already the condition of change itself. It's essentially one of shock, one of impact onto mm. itself mm. that is itself faced with a personal re a reimagination of its ontological being. Mm. I don't know whether that's whatever. Because struck could also mean broken, um, and not just form. No, no. Um, and you've got three minutes, Nick. Hmm? <laughs> you've got three minutes. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, two hard questions. Um, I've got to cheat. I've got to reply to this one first, while I give myself time to think about that one. Um, although I think that one, I think I think yours is one I can address more easily than that other one. The other one comes out of a different uh, epistemic tradition, an ethical tradition. Um, and that's given away by it's a void category. It's void at all, but then in a different epistemic philosophical tradition, it wouldn't be. In random, yes, possibly. It's a bit rarely, yes. I don't think that renders it void. What it does, though, is render it something that cannot easily be repeated or learnt or tutored or mentored or picked up out of the technical. But then so many things <laughs> in life are like that. Remember you more. Yeah? That's the message of remember you more. However, this, the question also is coming out of, I think, and I'm, I'm ventrally creating you, so forgive me. And it's also coming out of a very a quite legitimate uh, uh, desire, which I was expressing to the previous question, um, to take it another step further towards, well, if this is the case, what is incumbent upon us in order to change our practices of truth and truth and rule in order somehow to adjust this to this truth. Yeah. What, what, what follows from it? Well, one illustration is aware, in a sense of what follows from it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'd only get to it this route the way I did it, but I can get to it from my position, was the answer that I gave there, which is to reinterpret, reinterpret the practices of truth, truths of rule and rules of truth, to reposition them such that in the world in which we find ourselves where political truth is of us and where our forces of power and knowledge commit us to certain terminal courses of action to seek a way to find a solvent to those courses of action and to release the imagination to invent formulas and processes of relationality to one another as well as the truth in truth, if the truth is like this, that might get us out of the hole that we're in. That's why it's a hard question, because that's that's effectively saying that's effectively asking you to do two things. One, accept my position that our civilization is in the position of finding itself in a terminal position. It's a species threatening civilization. Driven by forces, protean forces, that it itself is unleashed and which in fact it seeks to complexity analysis, resilience, and all the rest of it, to seek to try to manage. But those protein forces are forces it doesn't control, forces it knows it doesn't control, otherwise it wouldn't be so preoccupied these days with the emergence of emergency and organizing its truth 
and rule around those non-truth events, if you like, of catastrophic proportions. So you have to accept that position, first of all, and then say, how do you get into the hole? And so partly is you get into the hole because of the rules of truth, the truth of rule, which have, you know, over four or five hundred years have become institutionalized, established, and second nature, which is why we use the place of ducks. I have to accept that, but that's terminal. And if the danger is such that a more fundamental revision of what we think truth is, and, 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 what, and, and, and the opacity of political rule that we face is, before you can then proceed. I don't know if that necessarily requires courage. I think it may be, in some sense, that the Assange's and the Snowden's and the, and the Manning's of this world are the waste. They're the ones who get wiped out. We can see from their example certain things about our system, but they're not the ones who want to save it. This is the task of court, as much as it is the task of political reasoning, which is a different form of political reasoning than the ones that got them into this position in the first place. And there is a history of being able to do that, which is also frustrating. This, the, the British Empire's retreat so from 1947 in India through to Northern Ireland in 1998, I think it was the Danish Declaration, was simply a record of revising your forms of political reasoning in order to extract yourself from political situations where you were in a cul-de-sac and all you were faced with was more violence, more expenditure of treasure, more corruption of your own system for the purposes of waging those kinds of conflicts, which conflicts you knew you were never going to win. It was only Blair had gone back into the reverse engineering of that with Iran, Iraq and Afghanistan. The outcome of which is 15 years of fruitless warfare, expenditure of treasure, death of soldiers, death of tens of thousands of Afghanis and Iraqis. To what effect? Time is up. Mm -hmm. <laughs>